Jason Rowe. A special hello goes out to Director Media for the Boston Bruins alumni, Mr. Mark Boyan. Nice to see you, Marky. Welcome to the Pro Hockey Alumni Podcast, the voice of hockey legends. This is the classic hockey show for classic hockey fans. We celebrate the history of the game with stories told by the select few who actually lived it. Get ready for an all-access pass to the heart of the hockey universe. In episode 48 of the Pro Hockey Alumni Podcast, we remember the life and career of the fun-loving Boston Bruins goaltender Jim Seaweed Petty, who passed away on August 31, 2019, at the age of 65. A ninth-round draft pick by the Bruins in 1973, Seaweed played in 118 games with the IHL Dayton Gems between 1973-74 and 1975-76. During that 75-76 season, Petty went 12-3 in the postseason to lead the Gems to the Turner Cup Championship. Seaweed was known as being rambunctious and combative, as illustrated in that 75-76 campaign when he amassed 145 minutes in penalties, the fifth highest total on the team. Teammate Steve Langdon recently said, and I quote, I would say he was probably the toughest goalie to ever play the game, end of quote. The Bruins promoted Petty in 1976-77, placing him with the AHL Rochester Americans, where he would play 43 games while posting an excellent 26-15-1 record. During that year, he also played one NHL game with the Bruins, a victory over Bobby Orr and the Chicago Blackhawks. At the start of the 1977 training camp, Petty was ruined with author George Plimpton, who was doing research for his upcoming book, Open Net, and because of that, Petty was often referenced in this book. After another stint in Rochester, Petty was up with the Bruins for most of the 78-79 season, going 8-6-2 in 19 games as the backup to Gilles Gilbert and Jerry Cheevers. And this would be Seaweed's final tour in the NHL. In retirement, he remained in the Rochester area and was active with the Amherst alumni. Bruins legend and alumni president Rick Middleton joins us today to recall his teammate, Seaweed Petty, and his unlikely role in what was almost one of the most historic goals in Boston Bruins history. My, you know, it's a lot of years ago, but I distinctly remember Jim because his uh, personality, uh, you know, he didn't play a lot of games in goal for the Bruins, but um, when he was here, he, he made an impact so much that uh, I remember him very well. And not only because of his personality, but his hair. His nickname was Seaweed, uh, and uh, justifiably so. It was a it was a good uh, good nickname for a guy that had hair like seaweed. It was uh, long and stringy, like a lot of our hair was back right. in those days. And uh, but he was uh, a, a combative goalie, you know, uh, maybe in the in the uh, the way of uh, Hextall, that that type of a goalie took a lot of penalty minutes in the minors, but, you know, when he was up playing for the Bruins, he, he, he didn't take any stupid penalties while he was playing in the NHL. But, um, no, super guy, great team guy, fit in well with, with the, the, uh, the guys on the team when he came up and uh, had a great sense of humor and just kept everybody in stitches all the time. Um, uh, uh, the one story I distinctly remember was he? Uh, they brought him up in the playoffs in 1979 um, as the third goalie, which they often have a third goalie dressed just in case of injuries. And <clears throat> it was a famous uh, game in uh, Game Seven in Montreal. And uh, we hadn't lost it yet. As a matter of fact, we were up three-one going into the third period. And in between the second and third, Jim Jim came down. He was dressed in a suit, sitting in the stands, and he came down to the dressing room. He came over to me and he says, "Hey, Nifty, I, I've been watching uh, Ken Dryden." He said, I said uh, "He loves to put his paddle down flat on the ice, and uh, the paddle meaning the hockey his goalie stick." And as most goalies do today, uh, but uh, Dryden was one of the first to do that in front of him to try to block any shots uh, coming along the ice uh, on him, mm-hmm. and. Uh, 
I, I said, well, gee, thanks, Jim. Uh, you know, I'd never really noticed that, but if, uh, uh, it's, it's a, a good knowledge that if I ever, uh, notice it, I will, uh, I'll, uh, you know, heed the, the advice. And uh, he said, yeah, he says, if you, you get a chance, fire it to the far side because it'll go in under the knob because the, the shaft of the stick is thinner than the bottom of a hockey stick. So I said, yeah, that, that makes sense. So Jim left, and we go out for the third period. Uh, of course, Montreal ties it up 3-3, as you know. Um, um, I think both on power plays. And I scored with four minutes to go to go up 4-3. And if you look at the, the goal on the tape, uh, I was in the left-hand corner, came around the back of the net on my backhand, and it must have, must have flashed in my brain about firing it to the far side uh, to go in under the knob because that's what I tried to do on my backhand, but I didn't have the angle. I didn't get out far enough. But because of Jim saying this, I, I swear, I, I probably wouldn't have made the shot if uh, if I didn't think about it. And it, it didn't go in under the knob. It hit Dryden's blocker on the inside of his blocker and went in through his leg. And, uh, you know, if we had held on and won that game 4-3, I would have given Jim all the credit for winning the game seven <laughs> against <laughs> the Montreal Canadiens and advancing to the finals against the New York Rangers. But unfortunately, as you know what happened, <laughs> too many men on the ice. And only a few people know that story because I've only told it like to you know, people here and there like yourself right now. And, and it never made the press, obviously. Uh, mm-hmm. But, uh, no, Jim uh, gave me a good piece of scouting advice there that could have uh, ended up getting us to the finals and maybe the Stanley Cup. But uh, it was not to be, as you know. That, that's <clears throat> that's one of my fond memories of, of Jim Petty. And, and uh, I just want to wish... Uh, him and his family, uh, you know, uh, rest in peace, Jim. And uh, we're going to miss him. Uh, I haven't seen him for many years, but uh, as you know, the hockey family is a, is a small one. And, uh, you know, there's going to be a lot of a lot of people coming out with stories probably similar to mine about Jim and his time uh, playing with, with different guys in the minors and in the NHL. And, right. And uh, um, my condolences to his family. Absolutely, we appreciate that. Once a Bruin, always a Bruin, and part of that uh, very tight knit Bruins alumni community, and particularly uh, that group of guys uh, in the in the late seventies, the Boston Bruins. So, Rick Middleton, we appreciate the time today in in paying respects to Jim C. Weed Petty, and we'll look forward to talking to you again soon. Pleasure, Mark. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this look back at Jim Petty, remembered for his colorful personality and tough on ice demeanor, but also as a loyal teammate and friend. Rest in peace, Jim Seaweed Petty.